is one of the, the wonderful DXers who not only does interesting stuff, he lets other people know about it. Sometimes yeah. incessantly. And we thank you very much for it because you have really opened up the hobby. You know, oh, yeah. everything to do, uh, you know, with uh, boosting portable radios <laughs> to the point where the portable radios is sort of an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> And he is going to show us how it's done. Now he uploaded, um, a, you know, his, essentially the background to his presentation a few days ago. So there's a web link on, uh, on the IRCA list, and if somebody's missed it, we can dig it up for you. But he is going to ad lib his presentation from that, and uh, he has no, he doesn't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. We don't need a PowerPoint. We got Gary. <laughs> Not with that. <laughs> <laughs> PowerPoint. Yeah, the PowerPoint's right there on the stand. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I'm Gary DeBach. Uh, I have had a DXing career since I was eight years old, and I intensely enjoy electronics. I was building heat pits when I was 13, and I had the the uh, great privilege in the Navy of receiving electronics training and all kinds of travel as a teenager to places like Africa, Asia, all over the Pacific. Uh, had the thrill of living in Japan for two years when I was in high school, so I was able to uh, pick up one or two sentences and <laughs> use it when we had the Japanese visit the cliff with us. Uh, the expedition will never forget uh, the three of us that were with them. Uh, we had a typhoon right in the middle of July, which just wiped us out practically. And we never had that in Oregon. But anyway, uh, yeah, Nick could tell you more about that typhoon in mid July, but uh, <laughs> we'll never forget it. Uh, innovative ferrite antennas. Uh, most of you probably grew up listening to the Beatles on transistor radio, <laughs> like I did. Uh, and when you had that little pocket transistor, you probably tried to see how far away you could get a station, if you're like me. And when you're lucky, you could get something a few states away. Well, uh, that pocket transistor has been improved by modern technology to the point where ultralight radios now, there's very little they cannot do that communication receivers can do. So about 10 years ago, uh, John Bryant and I, we thought there might be uh, interest in setting up a DXing group based on ultralight radios. At, at the time, people thought we were kind of nuts that uh, we were just wasting our time. You can't get anything good DX on an ultralight radio, and uh, John Bryant and I, we both had kind of a little quirk. Uh, we loved to play with antennas. <laughs> and so he and I kind of got together, along with Guy, uh, who lives, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have him right in my hometown of Puyallup. I'm the fortunate one, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of got together with an E to E 100, the, which was top of the line 10 years ago. We want to see how we could tweak it to make it uh, the, the hottest DXing sensation going. So we came up with this slider loop stick antenna where you slide the coil to peak a signal. And then Guy, Guy suggested this uh, Murata filter that made it very selective. And suddenly we had a pocket radio with a slider antenna and a narrow filter now you could take to the ocean coast and come away with things like uh, the old 639 Fiji, which used to be a big gun. And you could come away with, uh, oh, other things, just with this thing you could hold in your hand. And this was, this was a thrill, at least to me it was. I don't know, to John Bryant, you know, he, he never, uh, I don't think he ever really caught the bug like the other ultralight guys, but he was, he gave us our organization. Anyway, uh, you all know the history that poor John, he had this uh, accident and we lost him suddenly. But about a year after that, we had a technical expert in the United Kingdom come up with 
an odd looking portable antenna and he called it the ferrite sleeve antenna. What it was, he just got a bunch of ferrite rods together, he wrapped them with Litz wire and he said this is the greatest antenna ever invented. Now uh, humility was not his strong point. He was, <laughs> he, <laughs> he was slammed, he was uh, just slammed by Oh, people in the UK, ex antenna experts everywhere. They, they gave him no mercy, and unfortunately within two or three years, I guess he took it to heart, and he passed away, just like John did. But when this antenna was uh, first put out, we had three technical fanatics. I was one of them. The other is Steve Ratzlaff in Arizona. Uh, the third one, he's... I don't know what he's up to now, Kevin Shanilek, he used to be on Bainbridge Island. Uh, but anyway, we got this, you know, this design from Graham Maynard of the UK. We did everything we could to improve this thing. We, we poured thousands of dollars. Well, my wife's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we poured a lot of dollars <laughs> into these ferrite sleeve loop antennas, and all three of us had kind of a competition going. Who could make the meanest, uh, highest gain, ultimate killer FSL? And so the three of them, you know, ultimately this boiled down to who's got the most resources. <laughs> Uh, anyway, we had this competition going. After three years, I, I thought about this, and I thought, <clears throat> what good is it doing, 99% of the hobby, for us three guys to try to outdo each other to make the biggest, baddest, meanest FSL on the planet? What, what is this accomplishing? And I decided it's not accomplishing a single thing. We're just using up our resources and not getting anywhere, you know. What is the practical uh, side of something like this? eBay. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the, uh, you have shares R&D and <laughs> branch of the uh, Ultralight Group. And I had some household criticism, you know. Uh, somebody was looking at this and said, how much does that cost? <laughs> Another package? <laughs> And sometimes I think she was trying to get my eBay password and look at my, my eBay to see what the total receipts were. I, I managed to keep the secret. But anyway, I decided this is not the way to go with, with these FSLs. This is a breakthrough, but 99% of the hobby people don't know a single thing about what we're doing and they don't care because they cost too much, they're too heavy, and they don't know how to use them. So back in uh, 2015, I, I came up with this uh, very weird, radical idea. Um, shrink the stupid thing down to a practical size so they're inexpensive, they work great, you can take them anywhere, even on a plane. You go to the other side of the world, you can set them up on an ocean beach, and that has the potential to be a game changer in the hobby. Only if we get this thing down to a practical size, practical cost, and something that we can take into an airport that, that's not going to cause a security alert. <laughs> if, you look, if you look at the ferrite rods, you can't see it from your angle, but Looks exactly like a ring of dynamite, <laughs> covered up, you know, totally subversive, you know. You walk in the door of an airport, uh, you can almost bet that sirens are going to go off within five seconds. So you don't want to go around TSA with that. Something like this, they look at this and they think, what is it? You know, it doesn't look very big, it doesn't look too mean. Yeah, let them go, you know. I've I've been asked to pull it out, but I've described yes. what it was. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. That's a good So, one. and anything, yeah. uh, the worst come to worst, it costs me two or three more minutes. 
yeah. through security. You know, they want to see it on a table. They want to, okay, and they swab it sometimes. Yeah. Swab away. I've been swabbed once. Well, mm -hmm. same with radios. Yeah, radios, right? So they decide you're not well, going to hurt. There's, there's two. <laughs> okay, what we have is eccentric. <laughs> this is the one that we go on important expedition, believe it or not. That little one, if I may, the little one you had, that got its, my, the one you gave, generously gave me, yeah. got its break in at a cabin in Kalalock. Yeah. And acquitted itself quite nicely. Oh, yeah. The performance of these things is an absolute shocker. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I took. This very antenna, I took this to the Cook Islands. I, didn't, I never told you this. You got the Cook Island model. Oh my. This thing dragged down Bangladesh at 8,000 miles with an S9 signal. Whoa. It tracked down 657 All India Radio. It tracked down Brazil at over 7,000 miles in the Cook Islands. Nobody had even the foggiest idea that something this small could have any kind of performance even close to what these things could manage. Uh, so, you know, Craig Barnes, I have to give credit to Craig. He was one of the very earliest that <coughs> developed or really made the potential of these known by the hobby. He took one of these to Princeville on the island of Kauai and came down with such an awesome list of Asian DX. I was flabbergasted, you know, to be honest. So sorry. <laughs> and he's never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. And that's what put the island of Kauai on the map. Uh, in a couple of months, we have three guys that are going to, we're all going to have this exact same model. Uh, Craig's got his, I've got mine. We have a DXer in Australia that's so thrilled about this. He's got his model now. He's, he's playing around with it. We're going to the island of Hawaii, the three of us. Our Australian friend, he's an expert in Brazil, Argentina, and the Caribbean. Just, just what I don't know anything about. We are, we're, we're thrilled to death to have him. You know, so, anyway, I better get back to my outline. <laughs> Gary, that's not a problem for you, is it? I don't, I don't. <laughs> Beware of DXers going off on tangents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why they have conventions? Uh, okay, the four levels of DX in game with portable radios. Um, for those of you who uh, want to follow, there's a link with this article on the web. And on the other hand, if you have no interest at all, this is your chance to catch up on email because you can be looking at your device and nobody knows the difference. Right? <laughs> uh, the four levels of portable game. Stock portables. Some are very sensitive. Some are clunkers. Uh, there are some modern Stock portables, uh, I have a picture here of one of them, the Sea Crane Skyway, that are not bad. But you've got to face the reality. These stock portables, that internal loop stick is only about three inches in the max. Uh, you get the D808, the new XH data. That is a little bit longer, maybe three and a half inches. But still, you take one of these to an ocean beach and you might come away with one or two big gun uh, TPs, if you're lucky, or you know, on the East Coast, you might come away with uh, more because they're a little bit closer to the action. But still, you're not going to make much of a DXing career with a stock portable, unless you're in Newfoundland, like one of our guys. You know, he does all the Dan 37, yeah, Alan Willie, yeah, Alan Willie. But we can't all be living right on an ocean beach in Newfoundland. <laughs> Uh, I live in a much worse location. <laughs> uh, so anyway, what do we do if we want more weak DX? What do we do to improve this stock portable? 
this was the idea that John Bryant and I uh, and, and Guy had, had a big deal to do with this. Transplant a sensitive loop stick into the radio, replacing the stop loop, the stock loop stick. Okay, I have a couple of examples here. This one is the latest August Ultralight, the Sea Crane Skywave SSB. Uh, if you have one of these with the loop stick, you can go to Hong Kong and come away with a Radio Sawa in Djibouti. You can, you can come away in Hong Kong, the concrete jungle, you know, assuming no one's throwing a tear gas canister at <laughs> <laughs> You can come away with uh, uh, 1548 TWR, you can come away with uh, 1413 SDFM with one of these, with nothing else. These will get you in the ballpark. You know, they're not they're not something that you want to go out and have a de-expedition just with this, but well, these things can, they'll shock you once in a while. They really will. Uh, here's another example. I think uh, Satoshi-san yeah. knows what this thing is. <laughs> uh, this, this is a two-inch FSL antenna that's transplanted, transplanted in place of a loop stick into a Texan PL380. Works great. Uh, this is the smaller, this is a five-bar model. There's an eight-bar model which is kind of heavy, but Another Japanese DXer, uh, uh, Okamura Hiroyuki-san, he told me uh, almost two meter this kind. He told me it's, it's too heavy. Make it smaller. So I made this smaller. <laughs> and then he said, "Now I can carry it around better. You know, it doesn't hurt my hand." <laughs> so what is the comparison and reception? Are you coming to that between those two models? To be perfectly honest, they're almost identical. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a shorter, shorter stick too. It's much easier to do this kind of. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I went on, on another tangent. Uh, okay. Supercharged, supercharged, uh, enhanced loop stick portable. A good analogy. If you want to take a picture. And the only thing you have is your cell phone. Depending on what model you have, you can take a pretty decent picture or video with it. Now, is it going to compete with a dedicated camera with a telephoto lens if you want to take like Mount Rainier or if you want to take uh, something far away? No. But if it's convenient and it's the only thing you have with you, more likely than not, you're going to be more than satisfied with what your cell phone can take for a, a video or a still camera or still still photo. So are you telling us that's just a telephoto lens for a different part of the EM spectrum? You can you can think of that as a monster <laughs> telephoto. <lens. laughs> the one you need to stand for. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. For both. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of these. If you go on a cruise, like a, a famous Canadian DXer from Victoria is always going on a cruise. <laughs> he, he, not this one, by the way. No, no, no. <laughs> Somebody's got to maintain the show. The floor. He, he, he recently went on a nice uh, northern European or northern Atlantic cruise with an XH Data PA08 uh, enhanced model. He said, yeah, there's more. Right there. <laughs> Uh, and he said he was thrilled with the performance. You know, before this, he was trying to set up an SDR somehow on his cruise ship, and he, he never could get the hang of getting away from the noise and everything. But he took one of these supercharged ultra, or, well, not really ultra, like supercharged portable. He said he was thrilled. So that's another uh, use, like cruises. Another use I found out the hard way. I went to Hong Kong. I went to all of the trouble of taking all of this gear to Hong Kong. It's only one minor problem. You can't find anywhere to set it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 